Hello and welcome to Silver Age Silver Screen, a podcast where we watch, discuss, and review sci-fi, cult, superhero, and other stereotypically geeky films. I'm your co-host, Casey Jarms. And I'm your other co-host, Riley Thorpe. And Riley, have you ever watched NASCAR? No, not particularly. I'm not a big sports guy in general. Yeah, me neither. Like, my dad is into NASCAR and I don't get it. It's the boringest shit. Like, I know I'm not exactly being original with this critique, but it's just going around in a circle. And yes, yes, I know that doing that actual driving is incredibly physically straining and high skill. I get it. But it's boring to watch. They're making a left turn! What if there was like loop-de-loops and gadgets and jumps? Wouldn't that be awesome? And what if the drivers could flip their cars into the air and then punch the other drivers who are also mid-air in the face? Yeah, that would be awesome. I mean, everyone would probably die. Yeah, I am most definitely. So it's a good thing they don't do that. I mean, the stakes are higher. I'd watch it. Yeah, but that's really cool. If, If only there was a movie with that concept. A movie based on an anime from the 60s. And directed by the same people who made The Matrix. If only that existed. Yeah, I mean, I would watch that all day. Yeah, I'm sure it would be amazing and not bad at all. And absolutely, like, not insane. Bad shit crazy every single frame of this And movie. I'm sure that if that movie that, from what we've said, sounds like the best movie ever, I'm sure it wouldn't feature... The most annoying character in any film ever. And his dad played by John Goodman. Of course. Like... So anyway, we watched Speed Racer. Holy shit. This movie's a fucking trick. Holy shit. What the fuck? This movie came out in 2008. It's rated PG. It's directed by the Wachowski sisters. Yeah, it was directed by the Wachowskis, who made The Matrix, and then the sequels to The Matrix, which weren't as well received. But also they wrote V for Vendetta, but also they made Jupiter Ascending, but also they made Cloud Atlas and Sensate. So, you know, they're okay. Is this one of the good ones or one of the bad ones they directed? And the answer to that is yes. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, as we mentioned, this is based on an anime from the 60s of the same name. This is starring Emile Hirsch as a young, talented race car driver named Speed Racer. No, we are not kidding. It's not even a nickname, I don't think. No, it's not. The family's last name is Racer, and they named him Speed. You know, it's always fun in media when there's just such on-the-nose nominative determinism. I'd like to see a movie where there's, like, a guy named Speed Racer who is an accountant. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, my parents named me Bernie Blaze because they wanted me to be a firefighter. So anyway, here's your tax reports. Uh, Make sure you get these filed by the end of the month. I don't want to do anything with fire. Yeah, this is starring Emile Hirsch as Speed Racer, Christina Ricci as his girlfriend Trixie, Matthew Fox, Susan Sarandon, Scott Porter, and John Goodman, among other people. Okay, so what I wrote down on my list, as I keep mentioning, I take a sheet of loose leaf per movie and I usually fill it up. And I typically just write the story beats of what happens. I cannot express into words. When I'm explaining these story beats, I cannot express how batshit insane this movie is. Like every single decision in this movie, every single thing that happens is with a big what the fuck after it. Yeah, it's so ridiculous. Like, okay, we got a cross country race go. Is that a fucking catapult throwing beehives? What? Oh, and he just flipped over. Oh, we punched a dude in the face. Oh, look, he's throwing snakes at the other drivers. Are those buzz saws? What is this movie? Mm-hmm. You and I have reviewed movies that are good adaptations and movies that are bad adaptations. When it comes to anime, anime is, it's not so much a genre as it is a style. The Wachowskis here try to translate that style from animation to live action the best possible way they can. And for that reason, the style of it is so over the top, so cartoony, that it makes it a sight to behold. Honestly, I'm surprised this movie doesn't have a bigger cult following. To be fair, it does have a cult following. We Mm -hmm. do a lot of cult classic movies on this show. 
this feels like the most cult classic deserving film we've ever seen. It was a box office bomb. It was panned by critics. And honestly, I kind of understand that it's not a great movie, but it's so stylized and ridiculous and fun that, yeah, people love this. If you look on YouTube and social media platforms such as that, there's a lot of VFX people who like will talk about and break down scenes from this movie and talk about the style of what they did, what they were going for, what they were trying to achieve. So there is a growing audience for it. It's just right now, it's not talked about in the same vein as some other cult classics that we've reviewed. As time will go on, I think this will definitely grow in popularity. That said, The Room is a cult classic. That doesn't mean it's a masterpiece. So it just means a lot of people watch it and like it. It opens with Speed doing a race and it goes on for like 20 minutes because it keeps flashing back to backstory stuff. So let's just do the backstory stuff. We see a young Speed racer. He's in school. He's taking a test. He just writes, go, go, Rex, race, race good. What is two plus two? Race car. I believe this is what they call a learning disability. Right. I'm blaming the parents. You named your child Speed Racer. Are you surprised he only thinks about race cars? Some of these people that name their kids certain names, it's like, what the fuck are you expecting? You're naming your kids Speed Racer, and you expect him not to be crazy about race cars more than school. You name your kid Thanos, and then surprised when he kills half the universe. You named your kid fucking Kyle, and expect him not to be a douchebag. That's it's like, come on, parents, do better. But after school, Speed's older brother, Rex, who is a great race car driver, picks him up and takes him to the track with him. And oh my, oh, don't do that, Rex. Do not do the super dangerous racing with an eight-year-old on your lap. <laughs> no. They go over a giant jump that could most definitely kill them. Yeah. Also, all the cars in this movie are convertibles. Mm hmm That's so dangerous. Because it never rains. Can we talk about the tracks in this movie? They're Hot Wheels tracks. They're ridiculous. I love it. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. But the thing that really sticks out, at first like a sore thumb, is the CGI. Can oh. we talk about that for a little bit? This is Spy Kids level quality at its worst. Honestly, that's insulting to spy kids. And that's saying something. They're trying to adapt the style of the anime to live action. And they do that by using a lot of CGI. And with the CGI, they weren't going for something that looked realistic. They were trying to go for something that looked visually interesting. And for what they were going for, this movie sure does look interesting. This is certainly an interesting movie. That That's one word you could use for it, is interesting. The CGI is really bad, but at the same time, it's like, this is my narcissistic, piece of shit, egotistical film brain going, like, it was a stylistic choice. Yeah, it's definitely purposeful mm -hmm. that the movie looks like this. Everything about how this movie is shot is stylistic, and I don't know how best to describe the editing in an audio podcast, but just go look up any clip from this movie. The way they cut between shots and they have characters overlaid, like, over other shots, and sometimes cut to just cartoon style, like, charging at people. It's a very stylistic movie, mm -hmm. but the thing is, when Speed first goes outside and we see this CG world, it hits you like a ton of bricks. Yeah. It is just so blatantly unrealistic. Yeah. And, you know, as the film goes on, you get used to it. Honestly, I feel like the opening bits of the movie where they're in a relatively realistic world work a lot worse than the sci-fi city they're in for the rest of the film. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Just uncanny valley, like... Oh, uh, yeah, they're in a sci-fi city. It's all fake, but I know what a house looks like. That is not a house. I do think that this opening scene where he goes out to meet his brother Rex, then they're driving through the neighborhood like that. I think that is by far the ugliest looking part of the movie because, like you said, that uncanny valley, it just looks really bad. It's not like stylistically bad like the rest of the movie. It's just bad. 
Speed is driving through the race. He's beating everybody. And it keeps cutting back to his childhood, meeting his what, who is, what eventually becomes girlfriend, Trixie. She punches a girl in the face for calling Speed Racer a, quote, retard, which... Hmm, 2008. Really took me, even for 2008, that really took me back. I'm like, whoa, yeah. that's a bad word, obviously. But, like, that's a bad word even for a PG movie. From, I know it was like 13 years ago, but still. Also, so Speed and Trixie, they meet, and aw, they have their little puppy love meet cute. That's cool. And Speed goes back to his dad's garage, and he brings a package that the random strange man brought with him. And Rex, like, picks up the package, hears it ticking, and throws it out of the garage before it explodes. Yeah, and that's never mentioned ever again. No, it isn't. And to make this even more ridiculous... As soon as the bomb goes off, almost killing everyone, eight-year-old Trixie just says, Wow, cool beans. <laughs> That's her catchphrase. What can you say? Yeah, she says it a few more times during the movie. What the f- what is this movie? So it's cutting in between explaining Speed Racer's childhood and why he loves racing, him racing and beating everybody. But then it also starts going into his tragic past of how he lost his brother. And his brother walked out on the family, started racing real dirty, almost killing people. And then he himself, his brother, died in a race. And he just, the families have this shadow over their head ever since. And like you said, Casey, this opening scene is 20 minutes because they're just cramming in as much exposition as possible. The pacing does get better over time. Mm -hmm. And I would like to, on the point of Rex's death, add two minor comments in. Number one, a praise for this movie. Through the race, Speed is in first place, and he's seeing like a translucent version of his brother's car and racing it, trying to beat his brother's legacy. And then at the last minute, when he's about to get a better record on the track, he hits the brakes just ever so slightly, so he's half a second slower. That's really, really good. Yeah, that, that was pretty interesting. And also... So we said last week when you told me John Goodman's in this movie that there are two types of John Goodman movies, evil psychopath John Goodman and nice friendly father figure John Goodman. This movie has a different version of John Goodman. Mm -hmm. Asshole John Goodman. <laughs> yeah. I don't like John Goodman in this movie too much. I mean, I didn't I, mind. He gets better as the movie goes on, but like... In that flashbook, Rex is going to become a sellout and start working for a corporate sponsor because the corporate sponsors tried to murder his family and he doesn't want them to die. And Pops, John Goodman's character, is like, if you do that, never come back. You're not my son anymore. Huh. Like, what douche? Yeah, John Goodman was good in this movie, though, but I do agree. He er, starts... No, he's good in this movie. Yeah. I just, just think his character's an asshole. Yeah, he starts off as, like, this unbearable piece of shit. And as the movie goes on, I think he becomes much more likable. Not the most likable character, but more likable, I suppose. So, after this race, a bunch of sponsors are, like, trying to hire Speed Racer. And one of them, this wealthy British billionaire called Royalton, played by Roger Olive, who hams it the fuck up, and I love it. He was great in this movie. Yeah, he just comes to their house as they're eating breakfast and eats pancakes, like, really sexually, like, mmm, mmm, pancakes are love. <laughs> but yeah, he offers to hire them and takes them to his offices to show all the good things they can get if they sign on as a sponsor with him. Yeah, they show him this new state-of-the-art testing facility for their cars, factories that make the cars in like 36 hours, training programs for the racers. Mr. Royalton offers Speed Racer all the money in the world, all the riches he could ever want, if he signs up with his company. After thinking about it for a little while, Speed Racer turns down his offer. And then Royalton just fucking goes nuts. Mm -hmm. Like, he drops any pretense of being good. Like, I mean, it's obvious this guy's gonna be the villain of the movie just from how he acts and how earlier it introduces another racer who works for him and then gives, like, a scare cord and a lingering shot on him staring at the group. Like, yeah, it's obvious Royalton's gonna be the bad guy. But Speed's like, um, I don't want to work with you. I'd rather stay independent. Oh, yeah? Well, I'm evil. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you a secret. 
racing is tied to capitalism. And, I mean, yeah. Have you ever seen any NASCAR race? There are so many advertisements. Yeah, exactly. Also, they rig the races, but... Mm -hmm. I mean, the revelation that the sponsors are greedy and care about races not for races, but as a way to make money. I'm not sure that's really a revelation, Speed. Why are you shocked by this? I don't even think this was a revelation in the 60s, to be perfectly honest with you. One of the biggest problems I have with this movie as a whole is its runtime. This movie is 135 minutes, two hours, 15 minutes. This movie had no business being this long. Like, there was a point right before Mr. Royalton reveals, ooh, I'm the villain that we all knew was coming. Speed and Trixie were on their date, and it was the one where his younger brother Spritel and their pet chimpanzee, they were on a, they were on a date at, like, make-out point, but then they find Spritel and their pet chimpanzee in the trunk of the car. And it was around that part. I thought to myself, what when is the plot going to start kicking in here? You know, like it just kind of, we're just hanging out this whole time. And I looked at the clock, dude, it was like 40 minutes in. It was 40 minutes into the movie and we still didn't have a plot. What the fuck? This movie's long and I'm often a defender of long movies. As long as you give me a proper reason for it to be long. I don't, I don't understand what is some of these filmmakers making movies that don't need to be that long. Like, like, hey, uh, Zack Snyder, Justice League doesn't need to be four hours long. And Army of the Dead doesn't need to be two and a half hours long. It's a fucking zombie heist movie. You don't need to be fucking tour de force two and a half hours long. Like the plot of this movie is the little guy goes up against the big guy and must win the big race to end the evil and the corruption, put him in jail, whatever. That's the plot of this movie. That plot does not need to be over two hours. Part of the reason why it goes on so long is there's two big climactic races. Mm -hmm. There's the cross-country race that is the biggest chunk of the film, and that's to win entry into the even bigger final race. Yeah. It also kind of suffers because the first half of this movie is just a lot of exposition and setting up the plot for... A dumb action movie. Exactly. That's what this movie is at its core. In that regard, it works. But it tries to be, like, so much more than that. It tries to be, like, like an actual compelling and great story and develop its character. It just, it doesn't succeed in anything other than being just a mindless fun action movie with some cool visuals. Although, I will say you mentioned that the length and the pacing are the film's biggest problem. I disagree completely. The biggest problem, and you mentioned it a second ago, is that fucking younger brother. Yeah, with a stupid name like Spritel. Yes, Spritel. I despise Spritel. Like, we haven't really mentioned him, but every single scene throughout this movie also has Spritel doing something dumb in it. Like, ooh, they're on a plane. Oop, he's going nuts for candy. Ooh, there's this big revelation that capitalism exists. Oops, also Spritel's running people over. Like, ooh, Speed's going on a date. Oops, Spritel is spying on him. And he's just so annoying, and he's never funny, and he just bogs the movie down. I hate that kid so much. Yeah, he was... <sighs> Pretty bad. I mean, I, I I get the idea that this is essentially, at its core, this is a kid's movie. Let's be real. Yeah. It's a kid's movie. And I get, like, it's fun to watch this kid with a pet chimpanzee just doing weird, funny, silly shit. But the level of annoying Spritel can get, that combined with the fact that this movie is really long and the first half can drag. I have a hard time believing that a majority of kids would enjoy something like this. Added to the fact that there's a lot of fucked up dark moments. Like, there's a montage where his brother Rex, you know, the good guy, yeah, he almost took someone's head off and then he died in a fucking burning wreck of a car. And then Mr. Royalton is threatening speed. He says, I'm going to ruin your family's legacy, slap them with, like, lawsuits until they're broke. Yeah, I've never seen that be a thing that a film villain does before. It's surprisingly realistic. The evil billionaire in this movie 
He uses slap suits. That's how he gets what he wants. That's so realistic and awful. He also tells Speed that he's going to sabotage every single one of his races, or he's going to pay off all the other racers to purposefully take him out. And it, like, does a flash forward to Speed's next race, where he almost dies because the other racers try and kill him. Wow, this is dark. This is some tension. How do we build on this tension? Let's have Spritel and the monkey go in a trench coat and walk around after running a bunch of people over in a fucking ATV or whatever that was. Yeah, it's so wacky. Yay, Spritel. I hate Spritel so much. The wrong racer brother died. <laughs> Amen, bro. From there, from Spritel doing his shit and whatever, it immediately cuts to this guy who is another racer getting the shit beaten out of him and almost having his hand put into a tank of piranhas. Like, what? It's not a lot, but there are moments where the tone goes from like silly and wacky. They try to make it fun by taking the tension filled moments and intercutting it with like some silly stuff, but then there's some moments in here where it's like, it gets fucking dark. We almost watched a guy get his hand eaten off after he was tied to a chair and getting beaten with blood pouring out of his face. Yeah, so after all the shit with Royalton, it cuts to the introduction of our other two racers, Togo Khan, a young racer, who by the way, side note, mm -hmm. we've talked about it before, how Hollywood seems to fucking hate having Asian characters in their movies. Right. Yeah, this movie's super freaking white washed. Oh, it's yeah. It's colorful, except for in the main characters. Yeah. But yeah, Togokan, he's an Asian character. They have one. We're introduced to Togokan, a young racer who pissed off the mob by not racing for them, who they're going to dump into a tank full of piranhas because... Because they're cartoon characters, everyone in this movie is so wild. But Togokan is saved by Racer X, a mysterious masked racer who's also a secret agent. Who is definitely, definitely not Speed's older brother Rex. Definitely what do you mean? What, the masked man named Racer X is actually Racer Rex? What? No! Is that even a spoiler? Because the Speed Racer cartoon came out in the 60s. It's pop culture. Yeah, no, you see, I actually, many years ago, way back in the day when this movie came on video on demand, my family actually rented this. This was like 2009, I want to say, 2008, 2009. My family actually rented it and we watched it. But like, I think it got too late and I was only able to watch like the first half of it. So I didn't see how it ended. But when I was watching it, I was like nine at the time. And I was like, oh yeah, Racer X is the brother. What? No, no. I mean, sure, they mentioned that his body from the wreck was too burned up to be identified. But no, no, it's not his brother. Yeah, I know. Like, even as a kid, even as a nine-year-old, I was like, this is so fucking obvious. Oh, by the way, before we move on from Racer X, Matthew Fox gives me my favorite performance in this entire movie. Mm -hmm. He knows that he's in this silly, wacky action kids movie, and he gives such a good performance. I don't know how to describe it. It's like purposely kind of wooden because mm -hmm. he's this over-the-top cartoon secret agent man. I don't know. Just something about his performance is awesome. There is like a sense of woodenness to it, but I think that might be kind of like an anime style of how the characters are animated while talking and acting. Like, I think he found a way, a nice balance between actually adapting like how characters in an anime would talk and act in their physicality in the dialogue scenes to bring that into live action. He's like kind of overly serious with enough levity. I don't know how he did it, but yeah, I think he just kind of played an anime character and it actually worked. After Speed gets almost murdered by Royalton's minions who like try and knock him off the road during a race, the racer family is visited by this trio of Racer X. Togo Khan, and a police detective whose name is Inspector Detective, that's his real name, Inspector Detective. He and Speed Racer have the same type of parents. But anyway, they explain to the Racer family that Togo Khan has evidence that can put both the mobsters that are trying to murder him and Royalton in jail 
but Togo Khan will only give it to the police if Racer X and Speed Racer help him win this big cross-country race. I mean, I think that's a fair trade-off. I don't know about you. Yeah, yeah, because it'll make his company's stock go up. Mm Mm-hmm. That whole stock thing, that's not going to have any importance whatsoever. We learn that Racer X is like a secret agent, and he hides his face because if anyone knew what his face looked like, they'd have to kill everyone. They ask Speed to go participate in the cross-country race that his brother passed away in eight years earlier. Speed at first refuses with a lot of input from Pops, who just says, get out of my house, this is not happening. Basically, Pops said no for Speed. But Spectre Detector offers Speed the chance to say, hey, there's a lot of corruption in racing. If you help us, we can stop that. And so for that reason, Speed goes behind Pops' back to go participate in this race. I don't know how he pulls off that excuse because you can see throughout the movie that when the car isn't in use, it sits in the family's living room. Oh yeah, I'm going skiing and I'm taking the race car with me. Yep, no, 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 nothing to see here. Speed and Trixie agree to do the race behind Pops' back. They get to the race where Racer X's team mods Speed Racer's car because all the other cars are modded with weaponry and shit like that. Speed basically gets the idea that the reason why Rex left the family and started working with those corporate sponsors and did all that was because he was secretly trying to end the corruption from the inside out. The race begins, Speed and Racer X race together really well and are really in sync. I wonder if that means they're brothers. Yeah, probably. So, I guess we haven't really broached this subject. Have you ever watched the Speed Racer anime? I have not. I'd be interested in it. I feel like this is one of those movies where you would like it more if you knew the source material. Because during this big race, there's a bunch of minor characters who don't really have plot importance, who I assume are characters from the show who are more major villains. Like, there's these pair of women, and there's these Viking dudes, and there's this guy named Snake Oiler, because again, the name. I love those Viking people. Those three Viking people, fucking love them. And also, one question I have about this movie, What the fuck are the rules for these races? Because we know a few things are illegal. You can't pull out a gun and shoot someone. You can't use chain hooks like in the climax. But bee catapults, buzz saws, big old springs, all that's legal. What are the rules for these races? Exactly. Like, I actually wrote down here, why the fuck are people so shocked when people die in these races? Seriously. Why if someone like, oh my god, yeah, no, I'd be like, yeah. Of course it's gonna fucking happen. That guy has a catapult with a beehive and venomous snakes. Yeah, people are gonna die every once in a while. Honestly, let's see, let me just think. No one dies in this movie during a race. How? Everyone who races in these should be dead 10 times over. They're so dangerous. The race begins. All the racers have been paid off to kill Speed Racer. Once again, I will reiterate, we are not doing this film justice. Everything that we're describing might sound kind of grounded in realism, but I swear to you, everything is a what the fuck moment in this movie. Like, especially the races. Like, the races are... I think the best part of this movie. Oh, they're fantastic. Visually, again, the CGI doesn't look realistic, but they are stylistically done. Like, it's not done to be realistic. It's done to be stylistic. The races, in addition to looking incredible, they are incredibly imaginative, incredibly inventive, and really fun. I don't think I was able to stop smiling when watching the races because it's just so crazy. You got a trio of Vikings driving a car, and at one point, Racer X flips his car and punches one of them in the face, both cars midair. Yeah, in the climax of the cross-country race, Snake Oiler, like, pushes Speed's car off the side of a cliff, and Speed just drives up the side of a mountain vertically like a horse in Skyrim. God damn, the Wachowskis, they knew what this movie was gonna be. That's not an excuse for the flaws, but still, they knew what this was. And they knew what they were trying to go for. Halfway through the race, because it's like a two-day race, they stop for rest. And 
Pops turns on the TV and finds out, hey, Speed's doing that big race. So the whole family flies to whatever, co- what country does this race take place in? Um, it was like some Northern African, Middle Eastern, Mediterranean type place. Because there's like a desert and there's like snowy mountains. and It's a weird race. But anyway, the family comes and there's a big argument with Pops. And then in the middle of the night, Mafia assassins sneak in to kill the racers. As ninjas. Togu Kong gets poisoned. Pops, because he's just buff, manages to beat up all the ones going for speed. And can we talk about Racer X's fight with his assassin? Because it's so stupid. Like, Racer X, we've said he wears a mask. It covers the top head of his face. It's a cowl, like Batman. When an assassin sneaks into his dark room to poison him, Racer X grabs a shirt and wraps it around the bottom of his face like a bandana. Uh... He's gonna kill that assassin anyway, so there's no need to hide his face. A, that... And B, I mean, he's seen the top of your face and the bottom of your face. I feel like you can piece it together from that. And the audience can piece it together from that, which is important. Yeah. Oh, and uh, I forgot to mention, but Pops agrees to help Speed. They fight. Racer X was a little ridiculous. Pops just kicks ass because he's just a big dude. Literally lifts the guy over his head, throws him onto a room service tray table, and then kicks the tray table out the window. But, like we said, Togokong got poisoned. With a poison that makes it so we can't stand very much race. So, what are they gonna do? Ooh, have Trixie sub in for him! Yeah, because that's legal, right? Well, then again, we don't know the rules, so I could be. Also, does she have race car experience? Because this is a really dangerous race. Yeah, and they start fighting. Oh, and also, the villain, the gangster, shows up to assassinate some woman. Was it Togokan's sister? Yeah, Togokan's sister. He shows up into the helicopter with a gun, and the sister lifts up her giant sun hat to reveal that she is, in fact, Togokan in disguise, Able to walk despite the poison. What even what? I don't get this movie. This is a dumb movie. So they poison Togukon so he can't race. And also they're going to kill his sister. So they have Togukon who can stand, not just stand, get into a big fight to rescue his sister while Trixie races. And then they later sub Togukon in so he can race again. What the? F- this script isn't smart. <laughs> no, but as they're swapping Togacon in for Trixie, a bunch of the villain's goons show up with guns and they have a giant fisticuffs fight. It was, again, pretty inventive, very stylistic, but I will be honest, there comes a point where I feel like some of the style was distracting for me. I'm going to disagree a bit. I actually really like that big middle fight. It might be my favorite scene in the movie. It's just so stylized and cool, like... If you want to know what we're talking about when we say this movie is stylized, look up that fight scene. Yeah, I mean, not that scene in particular, but throughout this movie, I I just kind of thought to myself, I don't know, just the style might have gotten a little too much for me. But it was still entertaining, and this fight was still really fun. Despite the fact that all the goons have machine guns, the racer family, who are completely unarmed, beat the fight. Hey, they aren't completely unarmed. The dumbass brother throws monkey shit at one point. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. This is such a smart movie. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, they lost the first race, but once they replace Trixie with Togacan again, they start catching up to the... Who's the... Who's the guy? The snake guy? Cobra Oil? Yeah, he's named Snake Oiler. Snake Oiler. Because he's oily and wears snake skins, and they catch up to him. Yeah, they catch up to him. They have a pretty interesting... Like, at one point, Speed Racer almost punches... Snake Oiler with the wheel of his car, like in Transformers Age of Extinction. Speed gets knocked off a cliff, but then he starts driving back up because he's got spikes on his tires. Yeah, they go through the tunnel that Rex died in, allegedly. He did not die. I'm calling it that right now. And Speed Racer and his team win the race. Woohoo. Yeah, problem is Togacan sold him out and just to drive up the stock in his father's company. Who would have saw that coming? Yeah, he didn't have evidence at all. What a dick. Yep. So, Togacan just kind of screwed him over. And this makes Speed really bad. So it cuts to him just racing and... ah, He, like, screams like an idiot as he's just racing around the track. Mm-hmm. And then he runs into Racer X. 
and he says with everyone, R.A. figured out, hey, you're my brother. And Racer X pulls off his mask to reveal, oh shit, he's a different guy. <laughs> yeah, oopsie. Huh. Well, this film outsmarted me. Mm-hmm. I know. I feel like such an idiot. As should you, Casey. You and I, we're both idiots together. Well. It's just a fact. Hey, Speed Racer is smarter than us. We just have to accept that. Anyway, from there, Racer X tells Speed to just keep fighting, keep doing his thing, whatever. Doesn't matter if racing has changed. It matters if it changes you. Yeah, your brother would be proud of you because I knew him personally. Wink, wink. Speed goes home, and just as he's about to walk out in the exact same way Rex did nine years earlier, Pop stops him, and instead of telling him, hey, if you leave, don't come back, he sits him down and actually has what I thought was a pretty heartfelt conversation where Pops is like, look, I was wrong for that. You are my son. I'm proud of you. You know, I'm, I'm always going to be there for you, whatever, yada, yada, yada. I don't know. I thought it was a little pretty heartfelt. Yeah, I don't hate Pops anymore after that scene. Yeah. Also, I should note that Spritel, like, as Speed is walking out, he's like, hey, can I come with? And eh, no, wait your turn. And I love just that implication that in a few years' time, Spritel's going to become the big racer, and then he's going to become disillusioned and storm out, too. Pops better get working on another son, because he needs more, just so we can do this every couple of years. Yeah, exactly. And then the mom is going to be like, come on, Pops. I can't keep having kids. Stop kicking him out of the house. Like, so the big race, the, like, cross-country race, it was to get a ticket to the, the Grand Prix. world's biggest race at the end of the movie. And Togokan's not going to race because he's actually kind of scummy. So his sister steals the ticket and gives it to Speed so Speed can race in this big climactic race that honestly doesn't really have stakes. It doesn't actually have stakes anymore. It's just racing for the sake of racing and winning. Speed shows up to the race after his family has, like, there's a montage of Speed's family making himself a new car. I did kind of chuckle at this line when he was like, how long did Royalton say his factory can make a new car? 36 hours. We'll do it in 32. And then 32 hours later, they have a brand new car. And they take it to the Grand Prix. Everyone tries to stop him, but he has a legitimate ticket. And he is legally allowed to race. The problem is that literally every single other racer is out to murder him. So that might cause an issue. A character who I mentioned him briefly, like another racer. His name's Cannonball Jack, who works for Royalton. He, like shoots Speed's car with a chain hook, which is illegal, I guess, and tries to drag him off the road, and Speed's car breaks down, but he restarts it, and then he just guns it, mm -hmm. and somehow passes every single other car from last place to get first, and yeah, it's cool. It's a really cool climax. Yeah, visually, I, I, I will say, because I do think it was really interesting, because Racer X was watching from the stadium, and he's like, telepathically communicating with him. Come on, listen to the car. Listen to the car. Let her tell you what she needs. And A, I don't think that's how that works in real life. But this is an anime, so fuck it. Yeah, Speed just fixes the car and gets back to first place and he wins the race. And I will be honest with you, it was very inspirational because it was intense. The family was screaming. It kept cutting back. The editing I thought was really good, though I will say the visuals got really distracting at this point. Like that part where he was spinning the two cars and they were exploding. I couldn't tell what the fuck was going on for like 10 seconds. Yeah, I have no fucking clue what happens in the climax. I just know it's cool. Yeah, it was really cool, really inspirational. But like that entire final race had no stakes. Like you said, the conflict of it is, why is Speed doing this? You know, to end corruption. So that means that he'd have to struggle in this race because he's fighting that corruption. No, he doesn't really struggle in this, which, again, no stakes. He's racing to prove that he's a good racer, but we already knew he was a good racer, and the rest of the film was him stopping Royalton, and him winning this race doesn't stop Royalton other than just giving him a big middle finger. Right. And it's like, well, is he trying to stop Royalton so that Royalton will stop harassing his family? Because that was only mentioned like once in the movie. And that's like really the only conceivable thing that he could be doing, like from a personal level. And it just, yeah, no, there's just, there's, there's really just nothing. It's just a cool race. It's really cool, but 
there's just kind of nothing behind it, you know? Although, don't worry about how the plot line of the movie involves people trying to kill Speed because Royalton, because he cheated in the race, I guess what he did was cheating, even though it's very similar to everything Speed does, because yeah. he cheated in the race, and also because Togacon was swayed by Speed being awesome and testifies against him, Royalton goes to jail, and now capitalism is dead. Uh-huh, and Speed won the race, his family's all back together, but... It's revealed something that we never guessed before. Racer X truly is Rex Racer. He just had plastic surgery to change his face. Why does he need a mask if he had plastic surgery? And why can't he tell Speed? That's a weird scene. They know that the twist is famous and kind of obvious, so they have this plastic surgery thing so they can still have the twist, but I don't know if it really makes sense. Mm, it, that's because it doesn't. And at the end of the day, it's just kind of like, it's so obvious from the beginning, even with the fact Racer X and Rex had two completely different chins and jawlines. But even then, you're like, they're gonna explain that, though. There's a two-letter difference in their names! So anyway, that's the film. It's a fun time. <laughs> For nothing else, it's a fun time. And especially if you're a fan of, like, the Robert Rodriguez movies, over-the-top fun kids movies such as Spy Kids 1 through 4, Shark Boy and Lava Girl, that new one he had recently called We Can Be Heroes, which was kind of like a spiritual sequel to Shark Boy and Lava Girl, whatever. If you're a fan of those, you'd be well at home here. That said, I also think there's a lot of structural flaws in this movie that prevent it from reaching the same level as fucking Shark Boy and Lava Girl. And that is a sentence I never thought I would say. It's a lot like it, but it's not on the same level as Shark Boy and Lava Girl and Spy Kids 3D Game Over. Hey, don't mock that movie. That movie had Elijah Wood show up in it and then immediately die. And also, who was the who was the bad guy in this? I don't remember, but he has an evil Russian clone who says, I shall go to the only place without capitalism. <laughs> Space. And at the end, all the characters from the other Spy Kids movies show up, including Steve Buscemi's character, who in the second one gave the most dope line in any movie. Does God hide in heaven because he fears what he has created? The point is Spy Kids is dumb, but it's fun. And also, that's kind of what I feel about this movie. I feel like this movie is a little too long. The pacing fluctuates. It goes from being really good to being pretty slow. The way the story unfolds, it tries to be clever with a nonlinear narrative at times. Like the first 20 minutes, like we said, is really messy because it's just cutting through all this different exposition, completely different timelines, different tones, situations, whatever. It just is all over the place. And then even later on in that scene where Mr. Royalton is explaining to Speed what he's going to do now that he refused his offer, as he's speaking about it, it's happening, but then that, like, doesn't happen for, like, another week. I don't know. It's it just, it's weird. Some of the nonlinear stuff was bad. Everything with Spridal was fucking obnoxious. I have a different take on each actor. Like, Emil Hirsch was fine in it, but I feel like he didn't have enough energy. A film like this would require for it to really work. I just kind of felt like there were scenes where he was, I don't want to say bland, he was just average in a very extraordinary film. Christina Ricci, I thought was very good. She played Trixie. Matthew Fox, as you said, was great. John Goodman was really good. Susan Sarandon was good for what she was given. She's not given much. She's just kind of resorted to being the mom. Yeah, she has like one scene where she's like, by the way, Speed, I love you. You're a good kid. And like, oh, she's nice in that scene. But that's like the only scene where she's relevant. I don't know. Cool visuals. You got to look at it from a certain perspective, though. The racing scenes were a damn great time. If I am to watch this movie again, it'll just be the racing scenes. And honestly, that's a big enough chunk of the movie. Like, is it a well-written movie? No. Is it a dumb movie? Yes. Do I wish the movie ended with Spritel being hit by a meteor? Very much so. But most of this movie is just these big over-the-top race scenes, and those are phenomenal. It's a lot of fun. I think kids would get a lot of enjoyment out of it just because it's cool stuff happening in a movie. 
it's in the same vein as something along the lines of Spy Kids, just a wacky, fun, silly movie that is wholly original and wholly unique. I have not seen the anime, so I can't really compare it to that, though I will say this movie makes me want to watch the anime now. Yeah. You know, we talk about, like, old... Speed Racer is old school. Old school anime. It's like from the 60s. When people talk about old school classic anime, they talk about things like Evangelion and Dragon Ball Z from the 80s. I have never seen anything as old as Speed Racer. Yeah, no. Although I have seen a few clips of it. Just this one YouTube channel, it went viral, that's just pointing out all the times in that show where Speed Racer is like a sociopath. Like, Speed, you can't win this race. The guy you're racing, he's racing to save his sister's life. But I want to win. But his sister, I want to win. Hang up. (laughs) Wow. That was such a missed opportunity, not including that exact thing in this movie. The Wachowskis made an adaptation of Speed Racer, for good or for worse. I don't know, I think they did the best job they could for what they were going for. They really achieved it, but as a film, objectively, I think this is a great time, but the movie, apart from the race car scenes, I really don't give a shit about. Well, number, score? Riley, give number. What the number? Uh, number I give, it's really hard to quantify a a specific number grade for a film like this, like in a cult classic type situation. So I think judging all of it from sheer entertainment, it's a great time. But as a movie, I'd say there's about half of it that I could do without. So I'm probably going to give it a six out of 10. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same vein. I really like a lot of this movie. And the rest of it exists. It's not deep. The CGI is a bit distracting at points. It's unbearably stupid, but it's just so much fun. Yeah. I don't know, seven and a half, maybe? I'll say this. I gave it a six, but I will say this movie is very, very fun. But judging it based on that in combination with my thoughts on it as a movie objectively, it's a six. Don't go into Speed Racer expecting a tour de force Oscar gold, you know? That's not an excuse for a bad movie. I hate that as an excuse for a bad movie. Like, people are like, oh, it, it, it's not trying to go for an Oscar. But that's, yes, but that's no excuse for it to be a bad movie. Honestly, speaking of movies that we shouldn't go in expecting them to be good, what are we watching next week, Riley? We are watching Plan 9 from Outer Space from the man, the myth, the motherfucking legend, Ed Wood. The movie that he was filming another movie with Bella Lugosi at the time, but Bella Lugosi died. They couldn't finish that movie. So he just took the scenes with Bella Lugosi and put it in this movie. And it's still only like 75 minutes. This movie, it's infamous for being bad, like, many consider this to be one of the worst movies ever made. Ed Wood is the king of the bad movies. It, he, it's so bad that Tim Burton made a movie about his life, starring Johnny Depp. That's how iconic this guy is. He doesn't have the talent, never had the budget, and just, he tried making movies that were so outside of his realm of capability, and also budgetary, and everything else. Yeah, and it's going to be fun. Riley, where can they find more about this show? You can all find us on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Silver Age Silver Screen, where we post fairly regularly and we have a lot more updates of the show coming soon. You can all find me at Riley Thorpe, where you can check out all of my short films. You can also find me on Instagram and TikTok at Riley James Thorpe. You can all find me on Twitter at Charms Casey, J-A-R-M-E-S-C-A-S-E-Y. You can find basically every three, blah, 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 those were, those are words. Words are a thing that we say on a podcast. You can find basically everything I've done at CaseyJarms.wordpress.com. I've got a bunch of short stories there. I've got... The entire first book I ever wrote. It's called Double Elimination Soul Survivor. I've got video game. I do a lot of shit. Check it out. We'll be back next week, assuming we don't get plastic surgery so we look like Jack from Lost.
And as always, I'm Casey Jarms. And I'm Riley Thorpe. And hey, it's just a movie. Don't lose your head about it.